see the world through other people's eyes. You know, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Good morning, Scott MacArthur here and welcome to Artifact Live where we delve into the art and science of storytelling. Episode 42, uh, Life, the Universe and Everything. <laughs> um, I'm quite excited about this show because um, we, I've got someone on today, Rob Brenner, who I've known for a few years. We met, Rob might remember, I think it was probably five or six years ago we met um, in a cafe in London uh, to chat about things. and. This guy's got opinions, and they're good opinions, and I and I really really respect him. So I, I'm really looking forward to having that chat with Rob. But we'll get we'll get to that in a minute. Thanks very much for the feedback from last week's show, where we looked at goals and the importance or not of having goals when you're setting out to to get a message across, to communicate, to tell a story with or without data. Uh, interesting thoughts, and there was some arguments in the in in the comments about whether goals were something we should even consider. Uh, and that's exactly the sort of thing I want to happen. I think the I don't want us all agreeing with each other. So thanks very much for the the contrarians. I, I appreciate you. Uh, it was fantastic. Other things that have been happening. Well, we're the the, the market from my perspective uh, seems to be moving, but it's moving. It's still moving slowly. Um, it's been a fantastic week in a sense that that some of the some of the certainly some of the agencies I've been working with are now talking about live events again. How do I feel about that? I don't know, but uh, well, I do know, but it's 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 mixed. So it's been an interesting week, and uh, I'll have a little bit more on that later on uh, after I've I've spoken to Rob. So this week, evidence and storytelling. Well, this has been something. Well, the evidence part has been something that's that's been in my life for the best part of thirty years, um, and it's something that it's tied me in knots. It's confused me. It's excited me. It's stimulated me. It's annoyed me. I really have been through the mill with evidence, and whether it's evidence-based management, leadership, HR, OD, or indeed in the scientific domain, it's something that uh, I've often uh, fallen for, fallen out with. <laughs> it really has been uh, the whole range of issues for me, evidence, and and I know that my guest has got some strong thoughts on that. So I'll just bring Rob on. So here we go, Rob. I'll just click the B button here. Good morning, Hello. sir. Good morning, Scott. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. I'm Good. actually I'm roasting hot. Uh, I'm yeah, in this quite hot, yeah. Oh, I'm in this little studio at the top of my house, and uh, as you know, you get surrounded by lights. It makes it even worse. So, if I start to look as if I'm I'm dissolving, Rob, forgive me, <laughs> forgive okay, me. Okay. <laughs> so, would you would you be good enough to 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 give the the viewers and listeners uh, an introduction to what it is you do and what you're interested in? Sure. So I'm a, I'm an academic. I'm a professor of organisational psychology at Queen Mary University of London. I'm also the scientific direct, director and help set up something called the Centre for Evidence-Based Management. And one of my main interests, apart from areas around organisational psychology, organisational behaviour and human resource management, uh -huh. is about how practitioners can make better use of evidence yeah. in their decision making in their work to try and make their, their work more effective. Fantastic. So you're right in the sweet spot of, of, of what we're doing in this show. But let's talk about storytelling in that yeah. context, that context. Where are you? What do you think about? Is there a role for storytelling in what you've just described? Do you think? Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm incredibly conflicted, as you, as you said, you were about other things about this. Yeah. And in fact, overall, I think the the urge and the the instruction and the uh, advice that we give to people. You've got your data, you've got your findings, you've got your research. And by the way, that's both in terms of being a researcher or a scientist or even an internal researcher, doing yeah. people analytics, being a policymaker. There's often a lot of emphasis on saying, tell a story, tell a story with information. 
And the reason I think I'm very reluctant to that is that my experience of looking at data and evidence is that mostly it doesn't tell a very nice story. It (laughs) is boring. It is inconsistent. There are no findings. And the desire to make it fit a story, Mm. I think, often ends up distorting the data, the evidence, the information you've got. So you've succeeded in making someone listen, but you've failed completely because you've given them the wrong or incorrect or very biased kind of data and information. So it's an odd kind of thing. And it's just distinction, I suppose, between are you doing research, collecting information, collecting data, collecting evidence and sharing it just to persuade people of things? Or are you doing it to give people data and information they need to make better decisions? So for me, I'm in the latter camp. I'm not trying to convince people of a piece of data. I'm trying to, I guess, help them make better decisions for themselves. Okay. I mean, I can't disagree with that. Um, but can I go a step back? Because Please. what what one of the things that I used when I when I had a proper job, you know, when I was an HR director, I I was probably looking back on it, I was I was evangelical in terms of the and I use that word with advice on advisement, but uh, I was evangelical about evidence mm. and asking where's the evidence. But then I run into a a ma- this is a huge subject, but we're not going to be able to get into all of this, but I then ran into this barrier, and it was basically bullshit. Um, the whole of the, the HR function, it was called personnel when I started out. It wasn't even HR. I was a personnel officer. Uh, um, and it was all sugarly evidence, as I say, in Scotland. It was anecdotal. It was mm. poorly designed uh, mm. research instruments. It was non-experimental it was it was you know there was no gold standard it 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 was a shambles um and therefore i think my and this is almost like therapy for me rob because it was almost like i got so frustrated because the academics were no bloody use um you know it was all full of taylorism and you know you know uh, uh, and it it was very difficult to get a hold of it i don't Mm -hmm. know if that's changed um Obviously, you're at the sharp end in the academic world, but I, I hear a lot of talk about data in HR and in ODE and in, and in generally in, in industry. I'm still not convinced whether the data, it's just lots of anecdotes rather than data. I mean, I'm yeah. very general there. I know I am. I, I apologize for that. But where are you with that? How do you think it's going in, in that respect? Mm. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. I think for me, it's very important to make a distinction between whether you want to call it, and I know these are slightly different, but data, evidence, yeah. information, to make yeah. a distinction between what is there, what you've got, mm-hmm. what you can see, the claim that is being made, and the, the extent to which the evidence, data, information, the claim match. So the kind yeah. of thing you're talking about around BS or around anecdotes, Yeah, an anecdote is fine data if your aim is to tell a nice story and have a laugh with yeah. your mates. Anecdotes, exactly. perfect. Yeah. Anecdotes around something very important where you're interested in cause and effect. You're making a general claim about a relationship between two things or if I had an intervention. Anecdotes, not so good. So to yeah. me, I think it's it's very important to make a distinction between the data and the information that's around us and how much of it is really trustworthy and reliable, which should we pay attention to. And I think uh, what I sense has happened, although there has been, as you say, in HR and many fields, including policy making, uh, there's been, in a sense, an explosion of the data people can get, the information they can get. Is it better quality? I'm not so sure. Mm-hmm. So then what you do is a kind of signal and noise idea. You, you in, inundate people with more and more and more information, but yes. in the end, they're not able to make better decisions because it's not necessarily better quality information or data. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been I've been privileged to be involved um, in the Grenfell inquiry, and yeah. it's been fascinating. Um and one of the things that I've seen in that is that there is some, particularly, I have to be honest, I've been very impressed by the government policy people. You know, they're, they are not politicians. You know, they, they are they are very good. They're very careful. But what the challenge is all about, it's intangible issues that's holding it back. And I don't think anyone would mind me saying that. You know, it's about relationships. It's about yeah. egos. It's about it's about power. Um have you a view on that because i i guess sorry if i'm jumping about a bit rob but it's there's so much in this um i think one of the realizations i came to and i'm sort of qualifying my question is that 
whilst my fetishization of data and my wish to, to, to be focused on that was mm. with you 20 years ago, maybe now, and I'm not certain of this, but maybe now I've become, I've almost gone the opposite way because so many things are very, very difficult, if not impossible to measure. And a lot of these things really matter. How, have you a perspective on that? Or is, am I just talking nonsense? Yeah. And I'm, I'm, just to step, I'm talking nonsense. No, um, no, there's two things there. So one is I think yeah. about whether you can measure things. The second thing is about power. And I think it, yeah. is, it is the case that we are, all of us, embedded in wider systems and structures where people usually typically have more power than us and more authority than us and often just want to do things. Yeah. So a manager, a politician, uh, whoever might decide, I want to do this. So mm -hmm. I'm going to say I'm using evidence or whatever, but of course they'll cherry pick. And we all do this in our daily yes. life. We yeah. cherry pick information data that fits what we already think is a good idea. So that is a challenge. And I think certainly when we're thinking about evidence, data and storytelling, uh, it's often the case that people can tell those individuals who have that power, maybe they're quite charismatic, are very good at telling stories with data and information. That's often quite unreliable and highly cherry picked, but they're very persuasive. Yes. So in a sense, maybe what you and I would want to do with evidence and data is not the same as what they would like to do because they have a perhaps an agenda about having getting a specific thing in place for all kinds of other political reasons. Yes. Now, the other thing you said about lots of things can't be measured. Well, mm. probably, uh, but everything can be measured. The question is, again, can it be measured reliably and in a valid yes. way? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. You measure anything you like. And I think I was having a discussion with someone a while ago and they were saying, well, the things they do in their work in an organization or and with clients, they were saying it's completely unmeasurable. Yeah. And I was saying, okay, so do you make any claims at all about the impact you have on other people, organizations? Yeah, sure I do. So what yeah. are those claims? And they told me what they thought their work did. And I said, well, in principle, you're saying I increase that, I improve this, I change that, I reduce this. These are all quantifiable or quantified yeah. claims. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which you can either say, what I do in my job is so intangible, no one ever knows, including me, if it's have any effect on the world or people. Now, you can say that, but then again, that's a rather extraordinary claim. Yeah. So I agree things are hard to measure, and they may not be measured particularly well, but the idea we can't measure stuff, I think, is, is, is a bit, it's, not, it's kind of a bit defeatist in, yeah. and also maybe a bit unethical. If we're claiming to have effects on other things, other people, we should at least be able to back up what we mean by that. Yeah, uh, yeah, because I mean, one of the things that often fascinates me is if you look at, and there is the you know the Parkinson's law where you know has there actually ever been any progress in industry as a consequence of information technology or data? You could actually you can put a cogent you can put an argument together for no, mm. you can put an argument together for yes, of course, but you know, but, and the context is different and uh, regulation is different. But I do wonder sometimes if, I mean, well, again, it's back to the fetishization. I, I, I know a lot of particularly HR professionals who are, are now, and you've probably got something to blame for this, uh, are absolutely focused on data. But it's a disaster because they're, they're measuring everything and achieving nothing. Yeah. Um, and, and that's not your fault, because, but they, they've, they've fallen well, in yeah. maybe behavioral classic behavioral HR behavior, I don't know. But also I'd say from an evidence-based practice perspective, whether that's yeah. medicine or policy or HR, yeah. simply yeah. only looking at one type and one source of data is not what evidence-based practice is about. Yeah. yeah. So for example, in HR, if you only look at say people analytics, yeah. your, and the, your organizational data, you're missing three other really important sources of information, which yeah. include uh, scientific evidence, it yes. includes stakeholder values and perspective, and include mm -hmm. your own uh, professional experience so yeah. sure you can look at this data and i agree there's been a bit of a fetishization of yeah. the people analytics but if you don't take into account other sources of evidence it's actually not necessarily particularly helpful right so i no, think I, again, this, yeah. this thing about using evidence and telling stories i think people like to tell stories of their data and evidence and often only looking at one source helps them do that because they can tell a nice coherent narrative around something they've found whether that source is science or stakeholders organizational data or even their experience looking across different sources of evidence and different types of evidence often in my experience quickly disrupts that nice neat story that you're looking for yeah. and i think that's why one of the reasons I think, why people want to avoid that yes it reminds me of of um you know the, the sort of the cult of the guru you know the yeah the, there is a lot of that still and it's probably 
it's as big as it's always been. You know, it used to be the sort of the, the Alan Watts of this world, and yeah. now it's the Simon Sinek's of this world. You know, that they have a they have a very they're, they're very charismatic. Um, the but a lot of the the work that they produce is perhaps borrowed from someone else, perhaps mm. not well understood as it might be, and certainly not based on any experience. Um, I love. Like, I love your. I mean, have you got a perspective on that on the guru culture? Have you got? Sure, any, yeah. And I think yeah. I think if you go if you go right back to probably some of the earliest guru, guru books, which would yeah. be things like How to Win Friends and Influence People, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, up to uh, uh, In Search of Excellence, then yeah. books on lean management, and more recently books about whatever lean in or emotional intelligence. They all have something in common, of course, in that what they do is tell yeah. a nice. Uh, tight, pretty tidy, interesting, and exciting story. Yeah, by using very partial, often quite low quality data yeah. and information, but they're very persuasive. And I think that's yeah. almost to me one of the definitions of a, of a management guru or a a best selling business book. Is it does that people look at it and go, "Wow, isn't that amazing?" Mm -hmm. And I think the issue is when you're looking at data and evidence. If you only want it to be wow and amazing, you're going to miss most data and evidence there. Because to repeat, and I'll repeat it again if necessary, most yeah. data and evidence is not that exciting, but yeah. it is very important. Yes. So how? I mean, I, I'm obviously I'm familiar with your your model, the, the the different ways you suggest, and you've mentioned it already. But I think if we could just re-emphasize that again. So if we if we if we've got data, uh, mm. and it's been done, and this is a whole other conversation. But let's imagine in a perfect world. This is good data uh, about a particular subject, and it's boring, but nevertheless, it's really important. So, say, and, I'm, and I, this is not the, the reality, but say the Grenfell disaster that, that I did some work on, uh, there is some data that suggests something. Mm. How do we then communicate that? Or, 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 or I mean, Peter, there's Peter on here just says something sure. here about storytelling. Yeah. You see it there. How how do we then make that data? have a value rather than it because right. there's no point and it's sitting in some obscure sure. academic tome that's behind a paywall that no one can read oh, yeah and that's from. that yeah and that's that's an important but slightly separate issue yeah. i would and i agree with you completely but i would yeah. say the thing about if you've got a set of boring but important data uh, in order to communicate it i think you have to go back to those individuals involved and ask them what are they trying to do in their work Right, And if they truly believe that the boring, important data is something they can ignore, there's an issue there about the way you've designed the job, maybe yeah. about the way you've selected them, about where you've set up their incentives. An example might be if you want to get a train or catch a flight, when we can start catching flights and trains again more easily, you don't expect looking up the train time to be interesting. No, <laughs> you're not there for entertainment. You're not going. Oh my God, I'm trying to find out which train goes. Yeah. So boring. I'm not going to read it. You yeah. need that information. You're not after yeah. entertainment. And I think, yeah. to me, it's the same for professions, for jobs, for other contexts, for, for citizens. The question mm -hmm. is, you sh we shouldn't be looking for data to entertain us. Go to entertainment for that. Yeah, we should look for data to help inform us. And sometimes you may find it interesting. Sometimes you may not. That's not the issue. What yeah. are you trying to do? And how can you use the best available information to help you make a better decision, whether it's how you tackle COVID, whether it's which train you get. So yes. I think it's moving away from that edutainment thing. And again, as I mentioned to you before, Scott, I think mm. you see this in university teaching and training courses as well, yes. where the trainer or teacher or lecturer or professor, particularly because of the way they're rewarded, is more interested in, in entertaining people maybe than educating them. So as a consequence, they tell great stories, they're very amusing, they're funny, they're entertaining. And so students come away feeling very positive about the experience. That's yes. great. Did they learn very much? Possibly not. Yeah. I've, got, I've, got, you know? I've got Jordan Peterson going through my head at the moment, but let's let's not talk about yeah. him. He's, he's He gets yeah. enough of time. The, can I be slightly contrary here? Because um, if you look at, and, 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 and I mean, I know something you know from my career, uh, physics. Physics would not have got to the level that it's at in terms of public understanding, funding, representation, policy, if it hadn't been for Feynman, Sagan, you know, Lewis, mm. uh, you know, DeGrasse Tyson, without those, they were storytellers, all of them. Um, sure. And they are, I mean, I personally think particularly Feynman and Sagan have fundamentally changed the landscape of, of everything to do with physics. Um, so you're not surely not saying that there's not a place for storytelling 
are you? You're not. I know you're not. Uh, no, I'm saying there's a place. It depends what you're trying to do. So if in yeah. your example, if you're saying we want to make physics accessible to yeah. people who otherwise wouldn't know anything about it, yeah, uh, then we have found a way to wrap this around a story or a narrative without distorting some of the fundamental things we're trying to communicate. Sorry, yes. fundamental uh, data and evidence or theory there. Then okay. of course there's a place for it. I yes. guess my point is that often if you're not, you know, one of these the people who's extremely good at communicating in stories with using really good data, most of us tend to just want to tell a good story and we don't pay so much attention to the evidence and data. So sure, to attract someone to a subject, you may tell good stories. In a professional context or decision-making context, it should not be about selling them something. You're yes. Selling, unless you're a guru or unless yeah. you're a consultant, a certain kind of consultant, yeah. or, or you know, snake oil salesperson, whatever. Yeah. You know, then, sure, your job is to make them buy something. Yes. But yeah. as a data collector, communicator, your job isn't to make them buy the information. No. no. The, and if they don't want to know it, as I say, and it's important for their job, that's not that's something more fundamental to do with their job, their organisation, the way the job's been set up, maybe their training, and yes. say, particularly their incentives. So, for me, for example. In, uh, in my experience of managers often, and I include academics in this as well and other, and other professionals, is that often we are incentivized to, to, to move away from what the evidence and data would tell us is effective. Yes. Yes. In other words, for example, we're rewarded for doing stuff, we're rewarding yeah. for hitting targets. We're not rewarded necessarily for being effective. And if we're not, why yeah. would we be interested in data? So I could look at data, say, about how in my one part of my job, which is teaching, how do yeah. students learn? Do students learn through lectures? Not really. A lecture is a good way of teaching people, not so much. But nonetheless, I'm required to do lectures, and, and the ratings I get from my lectures may mm -hmm. impact at some point in my performance appraisal or pay or something else, even though we know that those ratings are both biased, not against me, but against other groups. And also we know that often, well, it seems to be the case that the higher ratings you get, the less students learn. So it's just yeah. a tiny example. But I think anybody in their professional life yeah. can probably think of ways in which they're incentivized and rewarded for not necessarily doing what's effective. And that yeah. means you have no incentive to be interested in the evidence and data that will help you be more effective because that's not really what you're being paid for. And yes. it's, a, it's a sort of, it's a, quite a paradox. And again, this yeah. applies, you know, I don't know who's listening, whether it's, you know, a police officer or, or, or a nurse or a policymaker, everyone's got examples of this. Yes. I would like to do this job better, but actually I'm just being told to hit targets. Yes. The common I, point. I, I, that is as a really interesting and 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 it, it's nuanced, but with a hammer on top of it. I mean, you, you, I, I remember uh, I almost lost a job once. Uh, I was HR director in the food industry in one of the big companies. It was a five billion quid company. And I raised an issue about the efficacy of performance management. And it was the old fashioned, you know, manager scores that they put a bell curve on you and you get congratulations your average you know that was the experience of most people in the organization and uh, and i questioned that and said well is that really motivating our people and the chief executive got really cross with me because he saw it as a way of motivating his stars and we had a long discussion and a pretty big fallout actually over you know what is the best way to do it now we don't need to go into that just now but so mm. that was my experience and, I, and it started I think that was one of the moments that I got to that conflicted perspective, Rob, because, yeah. you know, I was looking for evidence, but it, it just wasn't there, you know, and and the company, and this is, I'd like your view on this, actually. Do companies have the appetite to to, to create good data? Do, do they actually have the time or the appetite or the money yeah. to create good data? Well, I think that's a good question. I think it depends. If you're talking about, say, the uh, oil and gas or airlines, yeah. the answer would be yes. Yeah. Because there's very safe to critical organizations where getting something wrong has huge consequences. I think in other sectors and industries, uh, maybe it's not seen as quite so important. And I think this is one reason why I think using evidence and data and trying to use it more in your job, in your organization, yeah. it's quite a good way of finding out, do we have access to the stuff? So typically, mm -hmm. even for example, within HR, people might have huge employee databases with all kinds of data in there. Yeah. Once they try and use it, they find maybe it's not very usable or a lot of the stuff is not very relevant or people have just been ticking the same boxes and their performance appraisal, whatever it is. And they look and they go, well, actually, 
this is yeah. useless. We've got a lot of it, but it's not very useful. So I think, again, there may be an appetite for it, either where the risks of failure are very high or the cost of failure is very high. Uh, and also, I think, where people better understand how, you know, have, not having good data is not very useful. So it's a kind of, I would say it's a kind of investment. Are you prepared to spend time developing systems to give people access to that knowledge or oh, not? Right. To your point about paywalls uh, and academic uh, scientific yeah. should be paywalled. Yeah, that, that's it's a really clear example of, of a major issue. If individuals have to struggle so much to read a journal article that's relevant to their professional field, and even once they've paid $30 to read it, it's gobbledygook to them, they're yeah. just not going to use it. So I yes. think there's issues well about who is who's responsible for this, whose job is it to pull together data and information from different sources in a way that's usable for yes. decision makers. Yes. And it, the, the problem is the responsibility seems to not quite land anywhere. Yes. So that's my, why you might need someone whose job it is to be, you know, in charge of maybe evidence or the evidence curator or someone who actually tries to pull it together and that's their job in organization which i think would make a lot of sense to me but you would need to commit to it so yeah is there appetite there i think sometimes it depends but often not so much and again if my success in my job does not depend on how effective i am mm. then i'm not going to care yes it's not going to care and really that the idea of a someone responsible for evidence or data in an organization is an interesting one because certainly from our domain where we both work in terms of the the the, the, the hr and od space the thought of it being the hr person um and i'm talking very generally here it's almost comedic because um it used to be the hr person was the last person who understood data i mean they were the they were at the bottom of the day, you know, they didn't have that competence and they still aren't trained to have that competence. It's mm. not, it's not top of the list, but I love the idea of having someone, but then how they would then have to have an interesting mix of links with internal and external data sources, wouldn't they? It'd be really interesting that. I, yeah, and they would, and the idea is they'd be so whether they were working with, you know, HR, the IT department, finance, yeah. whatever it was. The idea, I guess, is they'd be, they'd be relatively agnostic or neutral. They wouldn't yes. go into it thinking, oh, this piece of software is the best that ever we should buy, or this way yeah. of doing our finance is the best, or this way of whatever, uh, of mm. doing performance. They, they wouldn't have a view. And the point is to not have a view, we'll be to try and pull together the evidence that's there. Okay. That, right, I'll part that for a minute, we'll come back to it. But there's a couple sure. of questions here or observations that I just, were about halfway through, so if you don't mind. Um, sure. Here's, here's a, uh, a comment from Andy Curry. Rob, evidence and data is meaningless unless it's part of a whole methodology. What do you think about that? I'm not, Andy, I'm not quite sure what that means. I think oh. if you mean you can't just look at a piece of data on its own and do something with it, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yes, yes. And I think there's another comment before about uh, tacit knowledge. Yes, from Peter. Story's been good for that. Yeah. So I'd agree that storytelling is is can transfer lots of knowledge and information that's not a question here uh, and that, that i would count that as data in a sense but it depends yeah. on what you're trying to communicate so for example if you transfer if you keep if you tell stories that are based on reliable data and tell people this is how you do things this is how you learn and it's incorrect it's not particularly helpful so i agree it's a good way of communicating but it still depends on the quality of the uh, evidence data behind that story you're telling if it's yeah. good and you're not distorting it through your story, then of course I completely agree. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I've got a uh, observation here from Doug. Back to the topic of method by which the data is given. Is there an argument that data needs to be made interesting in some situations? Yeah. What about school students, where uh, where they have to be in school and absorb data on a daily basis with only the hope? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you could argue, Doug, that is the whole problem with the education system. Yes, but actually, <laughs> maybe we should be uh, being, you know, aware. Why aren't people interested in this? Or what does that mean? And uh, why do we try and make it interesting? But I agree. There's a sense in which, in terms of teaching, maybe kids are the kind of things you have to structure the learning in a way that might engage them in some way. But that's not necessarily the same as telling stories that distort. So, for example, you wouldn't you wouldn't try and describe something about the solar system to kids by saying, I don't know, dinosaurs moved all the planets around. Now, that's going to be a much interest, more interesting story, yes. but you might want to do that. You might want to talk about how it works in a different way. But I agree, getting people interested 
is one thing telling a story that distorts what seems to be reliable is something else but i agree yeah yeah and there's another comment i'm sorry i can't see your name from linkedin but it says data and staff surveys there's an interesting topic in itself uh, i had the experience that data is poured over yet the personal comments yes. was graffiti and ignored hmm i think that can happen i think it partly happens because people uh, it seems to me often necessarily see quantified qualitative data which after all is what a survey is yeah. as, well, as soon as you get a number people think it's more relevant and reliable and useful which of course yes. is not the case at all a lot of surveys no. can be pretty poor quality and tell you very very little i think the personal comment stuff i think people find it harder to process and analyze so people yeah. you write i think will pour over hundreds of pages of cross tabs of kind of responses to things and actually i'm not sure how or try and get insight from it and it may be some of the comments that people have made are actually much more insightful and again it goes back to what is that decision maker trying to do and i think staff service is a great idea in that you collect information and data and often no one knows what they're for a yeah. question i often say to when i'm particularly for example in this case work with hr and you can apply it across the board to lots of areas you can say what would happen if you stopped collecting those data what yeah. would happen if you stopped doing the survey oh, and normally the answer is well we wouldn't have any data from the survey okay <laughs> so what why does that matter what would what would happen if you didn't do that and and yeah. then it's often quite a puzzle yeah why are we doing this so sometimes collection of data and evidence becomes a kind of ritual uh, that doesn't feed into helping people be more effective in their work it's yeah. just more data and information and i put with things like this things like net promoter score as an example other data you can collect about your customers and clients mm -hmm. some of that might be useful a lot of it i'd say is, is, is not yes. particularly yeah. useful at all and it's fairly unusable but it takes up a lot of time of staff looking at those kind of data, like net promoter score, and a lot of kind of trying to work out why it's low, not, well, does it matter if it's low and what does it mean or so what, or suppose we didn't even know this, could we or could we give better service by not having this information and getting yes. some other, maybe you could, so it also can be kind of distracting. So I think I quite like that example from LinkedIn user. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's a good example of collecting evidence almost for its own sake because you hope it will help you. But actually, yeah. unless you know what you're trying to do, it won't necessarily. Yeah. So, I mean, we're already at 35 minutes. I can't believe that. Um, if you had the opportunity to walk into an organization, a new organization, say it had a medium size, like a thousand people in the business, and it doesn't matter if it's doing a service or a product at the moment, how would you set it up? How would you suggest that they set it up to get the best value from the data and therefore and also the, the communication of that data i mean what, what would be mm. the model that you would be you would think there'd be some chance of it working yeah i'm, I'm trying to cage my be careful yeah. here, but yeah what, what would you like what would you what would it look like yeah Give us some od consulting here okay so I, I think the first thing and no, this is very obvious but i think you yeah. need to sort of say what is this organization for what is it trying to do and can you tangibly say what it's for, what it's trying to do. And can you not only measure in terms of numbers, but can you assess it in some way? What is it for? What is it trying to do? How do you know if it was doing that thing that you think it's supposed to do? Once you've got that, then you think you can start thinking in terms of, I think maybe it's what, uh, uh, I forgot his name, meant, meant about uh, having a, a methodology. Then you not you start thinking about what are the things we can do that will affect these outcomes that are important, we think are important for us. And then actually having a sort of model of change or some sort of logic model that suggests what you need to do to get to that point. And I would yeah. say the main way I think of getting people to do it is to constantly get people to focus on what their, their role is, what the organization's role is, and keep asking questions like, is this important? What am I trying to do? What am I trying to achieve? And, and if that's fairly clear, what it, I'm trying to do, what is most likely to do that? So I think yes. a lot of questioning, a lot of revisiting, uh, and actually making it, it's hard to say, obviously it's an obvious thing, but making it normal to ask questions like why. I think we've all had the experience of sitting in meetings and sometimes we want to ask why, or sometimes other people want to ask why, and after three or four whys, sometimes it feels <laughs> annoying or you're aware you're annoying other people. Yes. And if you're doing the whys, you're thinking, but isn't this okay to ask this question? And apparently it isn't. It isn't. Yes. So does that sense at what point is it, you know, 
it, it, it's okay to ask those questions because if you don't, I'm not asking ask those questions. If you're not clear about what you're trying to do, if you're not clear about how you can get there, then again, being interested in data and evidence information is going to be a long way away from your agenda because mm -hmm. you're not, you're just hitting targets and 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 doing what you're told. In effect, I guess. Yes. So I think I think it's quite possible to do it, but I think you probably also need to get those the four sources of evidence I mentioned. I think. You need to give people the idea that not one is better than the other. It depends yeah. on the question, asking good questions, all those kinds of sort of critical thinking skills as well, I guess. Yes. Could you just repeat the four areas that you, you're... Sure. You so, so one is the one we talked about a few times, which is, I guess, people analytics in the organisational data, data from the organisation itself, yeah. or if it's a national level thing, uh, it might be the country itself, data you collect from the context. Mm -hmm. Then there's professional expertise, so as a yeah. practitioner, whether it's policing or policy making, what do you think as a practitioner? What's your experience telling you? Then it's stakeholders, values and concerns. And again, that's typically, say, employees, or it could be uh, citizens, or it could be senior management, it could be politicians. These are stakeholders in the decision. Then the other area is scientific evidence. So there's at least kind of four, these four areas where you look into each one Yes. with your questions and you try and pull out relevant and good quality information that might help you answer that question and this cross this cross um it's partly about triangulation that yes. you check to see if you're getting the same thing but i think equally importantly it's about contextualization so for example sometimes people might use scientific evidence there may be some quite high quality well-conducted studies and yes. they try and apply it in a context without getting any other data now you don't know whether or not the evidence from one source, which is the scientific evidence, actually is going to work in your context Absolutely. and may be counterproductive unless you have evidence and data from those three other sources, your experience, organisational data, what do your stakeholders think? Because you might find out really quickly, although this scientific evidence in and of itself is high quality, it is not going to help us here. Yes. I've so seen that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've seen that often with the companies who rely very heavily on benchmarking. Yes, exactly. They, yeah, they yeah. get lost because they they haven't thought about context. That it is, it's that's a really interesting observation. And I have to say, Rob, I love your idea. There are the four different aspects. I think I, I know you've written a lot about it, and I'll point mm. people towards that. But can I just read another? It's a long one, so I won't put it on the screen. But it's it's what the point that Blake has made. Blake Jelly, yeah. thanks for commenting, Blake. Interesting discussion. Stories can be memorable uh, and share actionable steps. It, Rob has made me realize that when linking to data and evidence-based practice, evidence-based practice, it might be better to think about fables so that the lesson or moral of the story is not lost right. in an effort to entertain. Yeah. Yes, that's right. A sort of more right. sobering kind of yes, indeed. So you might say, and this is it, I think this is the the interesting thing about these narratives. Even if you take scientific articles. Yes. They also tend to follow this storytelling storytelling narrative structure. So typically they might say, oh, there's this really important question or topic. These researchers found this. These researchers found that. Oh, my God, it's quite contradictory. But you know what? Those researchers did not think about this other variable, this other thing. And we are yeah. going to measure that. And look, we measured it. And look what happened when we did that. We found out why it was so contradictory. Da -da! Here's the answer. Now, this, this is a good example of storytelling where, where I think often researchers are, are sort of distorted, trying to tell a nice story about something to get mm. it published. Now, if they did that whole thing and said, you know what? What we found is this thing we discovered or the thing we included, it made absolutely no difference. It's actually quite hard to get that stuff published. So as Blake said, maybe it's more a fable. It's as in, it's a, you know what? We, huh, we didn't find that. It's not a very interesting story. It's not as fun as, da-da, we found the answer but it might be more instructive. Yes, it's a good point to think of that there are different kinds of stories with different endings. And some of those stories is, you know what? Didn't work. We don't know. That's yeah. the end of the story. We and I was thinking know. about narratives and stories. I was thinking about uh, plays and things. I think about Samuel Beckett and Waiting for Godot. Yeah. And I think, for me, when I sometimes sort of listen to that kind of, uh, of drama where it actually is not at all, at all sort of traditional narrative, Sometimes to me, that's what data is. Maybe it's just me. Sometimes to me, that's what data and evidence is like. There's not a neat story. What there is is sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's weird. Sometimes it's boring. Sometimes it's confusing. And that's the way I experience often lots of data information uh, yes. rather than being a nice, happy, you know, nice story with a clear yeah, ending. Yeah. Thank it's you, a, Bob. Uh, 
There, there's a lo- there's a lovely comment here from Graham Rose about Ebola, but we'll come back to that Graham in a minute because I quite like to have a go at that between us. Um, but um, final main issue that I wanted to ask sure. you about uh, uh, is there. Is there an example of, you know, somewhere we could look up to, you know, something that you think they do it really well? And given the context discussion we've already had, you know, it's got caveats on it. That's fine. So is there mm. an example? And the, the secondary part of the question is, are we just talking nonsense here? Is it all utopian? You know, if you get thousands of people in an organisation, it's never going to work. It's all about money. It's a load of bullshit. It's just companies. I mean, it's like the word engagement, meaningless, but it's everywhere. NLP, pretty meaningless, but it's everywhere. You know, there's all these fads, all nonsense. Are we just wasting our time? So the first part was, and I'm being, I know I'm being contentious, but first yeah. part was, is there somewhere to look that you could set, suggest to our, our viewers and listeners that, you know, there's a rich vein or it looks like there could be things here that you could really learn from? Okay, so I'll do the second part first. I okay. don't know, and if I did know, I might just be trying to tell a nice story. So I'll probably <laughs> resist it. I can think about that and get back to you. The second yeah. thing you said is quite interesting. You said, look, is it all just about the money? Is it all just about yeah. the money? It's not about... Well, what's interesting is is if you really are all about the money, yeah. then you really want to pay a lot of attention to data and evidence. And yeah. what's yeah. to me yeah. about organisations yeah. is they often claim a financial or economic imperative but when you look at the, what they do, you think, well, actually, that's not, it's not really, it's not the main motivation. You're doing this thing, say it's employee engagement, because you think it's cool. Yeah. You're doing this thing because everyone else is doing it. If you were really interested in financial bottom line, you wouldn't do that because yeah. you pay more attention. So what, what's interesting, is that, so yeah, people often say to me, same kind of question you're asking, why would people do this? All they're interested in money. Well, if you are, great. Then you yeah. should be interested in evidence as well because you have a very particular kind of outcome you're interested in. If you have other outcomes, like I want to get promoted, I want to create an empire in this organisation that's going to give me a lot of power, fine. Then, yes. yeah, do other stuff. Yes. Uh, but even that, some evidence might help, I guess, apart from if you're just very charismatic or something. Um, yes. Yeah, so I, I think I – think, I don't have a good example, but I think, yeah – it depends what it does depend what you're interested in how you want to do it for sure yeah yeah i get i mean if you look at the the sort of and you got to be careful with your words um but some of the the tidal waves that hit organizations that they haven't predicted like covid's a good example but mm. for example in in the in linkedin at the moment there's virtually every post is about racism or dni yeah. or the, you know, it's a whole thing at the moment and companies are you know responding to that they i mean Goodness knows what they were doing 25 years ago when this all started, but they're responding again to that. And, and so they should be. But, you know, that to me, I think it, it's a good example because a lot of those organisations, it's a fear of the public coming down on them, which I think will happen to some companies. Yeah. Uh, and whether, whether or not, I don't know if that's a bit, is that a bit of evidence? I mean, look at Witherspoon. I mean, there's, there's an argument. It, that I, think, I, I think it's about, it's, I think it's about prioritising action over evidence. Right, okay. It's about saying, it's the old, you know, we need to do something, this is something, let's do it. So it's prioritising doing stuff over trying to really understand what, what the issue or problem is. I did a right. post on LinkedIn and Twitter a while ago I was, because I read an article about um, COVID hygiene theatre. Yeah. Uh, and this <laughs> what is, is based on, if it was original, it's based on the idea that after 9-11, uh, as some people remember, lots of new airport security measures introduced. And somebody described these as security theatre. So the little right. box and all this, a lot, you know, maybe some of the things made a difference. A lot of the things kind of did not. So I guess you could look at things. I would include DNI, for example, EDI, and that to some extent. They yeah. are theatre. They are they are saying, look at us. We we are doing stuff. We're trying to be, look at me. I'm washing my hands. Yes. Even though compared to other things, it doesn't make much difference. Uh, but I'm going to do all this stuff. We're going to throw everything at it. And again, the problem with that is, it's not only is it it's something that's then ignoring the data and evidence. Also, it's very distracting. So it's been argued in the case of COVID, for example, because people are told to wash their hands, even though we know, my understanding is, the major transmission is, is aerosol spray. It's not foam, whatever it's called. Yeah. It's fine to ask people to wash their hands. People say it does no harm. The argument is it does do harm because it makes it distracts people from the most important thing which yes. is aerosol transmission. So sure, yes. you can do loads of DNI, whatever it is, stuff, uh, or things around mental health, all those things where people feel they need to do something. 
but actually if some of it's irrelevant or not working it, in the end it's not it's actually harming what you're trying to do yes so i think one way of thinking about all those activities i think they are linked to evidence and data in that i say the prioritizing doing stuff and doing lots of stuff over what actually is the issue the problem the opportunity here what is the evidence for that and once we're reasonably clear about that what is the evidence and data about what is the most likely solution or intervention to help us with that or yes. those steps are kind of missed out and yes. things are done yes very interesting okay well look th this discussion is absolutely fascinating but we're going to have to draw towards the end now we're right. over time now but let me just ask you one of the graham's asked this question if ebola landed in the uk 10 years ago with oxford immunology developments would there now be a cure <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i don't yeah. know let, let, let me respond to that in a way, Graham, because it, it's a bit like one of the misunderstandings here is about complexity. Um, there has been more money, and, and many, many argue disproportionately more money put into HIV research in the last 20 years. Careers in immunology and vir virology have been destroyed because of money going into one area because it was very focused. And it's important, uh, but they still haven't found a cure. They've found a way of managing it, but they haven't found a cure. And the reason for that is it doesn't matter how much money you throw at certain things, it's not about money, it's about complexity. However, in other things like COVID, which is simple, doesn't mutate as much, money had a significant part to play and is getting to these, uh, the, the current uh, jabs or jags as we call them in Scotland. So, But it's a very complex area, so I don't know either about Ebola. Ebola is complex, I think it's a lot more complex than COVID, so it wouldn't matter how much money you threw at it. You'd maybe slow it, speed up the process, but it would still take decades as it has with the common cold and HIV. That that would be a very pseudoscience, so well, it's not pseudoscience, it's a real science -y response to that. Let me, um, there's a couple of other things we can just do before we, we finish here. Here's some the uh, Amazon have it down to a fine art re money, uh, the, the money motive, appealing to dopamine rush with others who bought X also buy Y. Yeah, I don't know if I can argue but with that. May, dopamine rush may or may not be the mechanism, but yes. Yeah. Like the next comment, the washing hands are significantly reduced flu infections. Yes. I mean, that yes, may I... be the case. But the question is, what are we trying to do? Yeah. The instructions to wash hands wasn't given at least a year and a half ago to reduce yeah. flu. Now, you're right. An accidental, possibly good side effect has been it's reduced that. But what's yes. the cost of that? If the cost is people not realizing the air transmission thing as clearly or as cleanly as, they, as it were, as they would, yeah then maybe it hasn't helped. Great. It's had that accidental effect, but yeah. was that really what we were trying to do? So I yes. take your point, but yes. I still would argue it's maybe diluted the message a bit. Yeah, and distracted some of the some of the, the, the PR around it as well, I suspect. But uh, that's probably a, a policy matter. Well, Rob, that has been a fantastic conversation. I knew it would be, and it was. Um, uh, and it's now evidence-based because people can re-watch this on replay. So if people want to um, look at more of your work or read more of your work, where, where would be the best places for people to go to have a look, Rob, please? Yeah, if you just, I've got a sufficiently unusual name, but if you just Google Rob Brina, you'll probably find my Queen Mary page and www.robbrina.com because it's okay. just say sufficiently unusual. So yeah, you can find okay. things probably... D Probably robbina.com is the best thing to find most things, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sure you'll get some traffic to have a look at that, and I will also put some in the, the comments, the links rather, on the on the video when it comes out, Rob. Rob, thank you ever so much for okay, joining well. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Time. That was the fastest 49, 50 minutes I think I've had on the show. So thanks ever so much, and I hope we can speak again because I suspect there's a lot more we could have a very sure. good Sure, we're delighted. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope... Everybody enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, you could probably see the, the little boy coming out in me there because uh, it's a bit like a sweetie shop uh, for me talking to someone as as expert as Rob and how interesting his perspectives are. Um, and I hope you I hope you go away think, uh, thoughtful. And I think Rob's point about being questioning and asking the why question is something that I would love to hope that we could encourage people to do more of as a consequence of this. So just thanks again, uh, Rob. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, next week, I've got a plan. Uh, however, I'm not going to tell you yet because it, it's one of those plans that might not work. <laughs> so I'm going to keep it to myself at the moment. Um, but nevertheless, if it comes off, it's a cracker. Uh, and I hope I hope you find it uh, interesting when we get there. Um, a couple of books just to recommend to you on this front. Um, one behind me here. Um, I've spoken many times about Nancy, Nancy, Nancy Duarte's work. 
And this is her book about data story and how to communicate data effectively. Now, as Rob said, you know, you need to be careful and make sure it's good data. It's, it's valuable data. And you've got to remember the context. But Nancy Duarte's work is very helpful in that perspective. So thank you ever so much for everybody for tuning in. It's been great. And I really, really liked um, the, the level of interaction this week, folks. Thanks very much. Uh, Rob, uh, Doug's just saying, really interesting chat. We'd love to hear another one in the future. Thank you. Thanks very much for the feedback, Doug. That's really very much appreciated. Remember, when you leave this today, look out for your own stories, because you know what, guys? Those stories might change the world. And I believe at the moment that it's something that we should be thinking more and more about. And I hope you enjoyed it. See you next week. Thanks very much. My name is Scott MacArthur. You've been watching and listening to Artifact Live, the art and science of storytelling.